Good morning. Well, I hope you're all well. I always say that, don't I? But uh, increasingly, uh, we need to be praying for folk to be well, don't we? Um, as we hear more and more of people having to self-isolate. Just actually, um, uh, you're expecting to see me live this morning, but because with Brian's having to self-isolate, we're not live, uh, and not just with Brian self-isolating, but a number of reasons we can't do it now until the 15th. So, so you don't have to switch on until 10.45 for another couple of weeks, but on the 15th of November, we will be broadcasting live, God willing. And then uh, a couple of weeks later, we're hoping to um, bring folk into church at some point in November. Just so you know what that's gonna look like, um, it won't be the same as it normally is, obviously. There will be less people here. We've got a capacity, we're estimating, between 40 and 45 people who are going to be able, uh, able to allow in on a Sunday. And obviously that will be socially distanced. We could do with knowing, having an idea of the numbers who are interested in, in coming back to church. Um, so there will be an email address on the bulletin that you've received. And also there's a phone number for those who haven't got email. For you to contact if you could send an email or ring that number and let us know whether you're interested in coming back uh, in the month of November through into December and also how many in your household will be wanting to come back so we can gauge the numbers uh, and decide how often you're going to be able to come to church etc church as I said will won't be exactly the same there'll be a prayer there'll be a sermon and there will be some initially some YouTube songs being played and it will last for um, just over the half hour um, but you'll be able to see each other you won't be able to talk <laughs> um, because of the current restrictions and especially the fact that we're in tier three but you'll see each other um, so if you are able to come then please send the email or ring the number that is on the bulletin and it'll be good to get back together also in november we're hoping that the bb and the gb groups girls brigade and boys brigade will be starting to meet again as well as the ypf and hub currently assessing the risk assessments and making sure everything is safe and once we're happy with that everyone's happy with that we'll be announcing exactly when that's going to be uh, in the month of November we hope and we're praying that that's going to be the case these are difficult days the testing days and we have to make sure that we get it right and that we meet safely as I said there are a number of people uh, in the congregation at the moment who are testing positive or, or have tested positive there are about seven people that we know of have tested positive just this last week um, and at least 15 people are having to self-isolate so it's a it's a virus that is really affecting us and just the wider church family there's lots of folk who who know folk who are now struggling with the virus so we have to make sure that when we come together that we're safe and that we're operating in accordance with the government guidelines so we still want to be together so if you're interested in in being part of that then please please join with us uh, or please send i should say the email or or ring the number so that we as, as deacons and trustees can plan the actual numbers and how we're going to go about doing it so thank you can we just pray can we pray um for all those who are struggling with the virus at the moment so let's let's pray father we thank you that we have these plans in place we thank you that we are moving towards being able to to meet together again lord you are sovereign you know all of our tomorrows so we are trusting in you for our tomorrows as we make these plans father we would pray for those who are currently um, testing positive within the congregation Lord, we pray, Lord, that this virus would not take hold and that they would quickly get better. We pray again against the virus spreading any further. We pray for those who are having to self-isolate, that none of them would catch the virus. Lord, we are mindful of many who have lost loved ones as a result of this terrible disease. And again, we would, we would pray for them this morning. 
I think there's ever someone who we all know, Lord, well, all of us know someone who's been affected or have lost someone as a result of this virus. So, Lord, we lift them up to you. All those families who are grieving, all those families in our nation who are, are grieving every day as the numbers are going up. Please, Lord, would you bring a vaccine? Lord, would you move mightily in our streets and dispel this virus? Please, we ask. We long to be together again. We long to be together properly, singing our hearts out. We can't do that at the moment, Father. So please, would you order our days in the days ahead to bring us back together without this virus in place. And until you do that, Lord, we pray for patience and for your peace. As we still sit in our homes and we listen to the message today, we pray that we would be overflowing with a joy in the Lord, despite the dark clouds that are all around us. So bless us in our time this morning. Help us to look up and see you, we pray. In Jesus' name. Amen. Well, last Sunday morning, as the song says, we cast our minds back to Calvary as we studied together the Apostle John's eyewitness account of the most significant day in the history of all mankind. Well, this week I've decided to stay on Calvary's hillside uh, and for us to meditate on Luke's account about, about, particularly about the two criminals who were crucified either side of Jesus. So if you have your Bibles with you, please turn with me to Luke chapter 23. That's Luke 23. And we're going to be reading from verse 32 to 43. Let's hear the word of God. Two others who were criminals were led away to be put to death with him. And when they came to the place that is called the skull, there they crucified him and the criminals, one on his right and one on his left. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they cast lots to divide his garments. And the people stood by watching, but the rulers scoffed at him, saying, He saved others, let him save himself, if he is the Christ of God, his chosen one. The soldiers also mocked him, coming up and offering him sour wine and saying, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There is also an inscription over him, This is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who was hanged railed at him, saying, are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him, saying, Do you not fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we are receiving the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. And he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And he said to him, Truly, I say to you, today, you will be with me in paradise. So Luke transports us back to the hillside outside Jerusalem, where Jesus has been crucified between these two criminals. It's going dark. It's eerie. Women are wailing. Angry men, religious leaders, soldiers are screaming at the man crucified in the middle. This king of the Jews, mocking him. And amongst all this, Luke recounts how two men and one saviour met with their deaths. In the passage we read, we have witnessed the dying thoughts and actions of two criminals. Both with very similar backgrounds. Both convicted of, of hideous crimes. It's highly likely that both were violent men. But in those six hours that they hung on the cross next to Jesus, we encounter two very different reactions to the king of the Jews who hangs between them. It's a very intimate scene. And one that has been preserved in scripture to make us reflect on we, where we stand with Jesus. Apply this passage to yourself this morning and ask yourself the question, who am I more like? 
Am I like the man on one side of Jesus who rejected the Savior? Do I still reject Jesus? Or am I like the man with a believing heart on the other side of Jesus who heard those golden words of comfort? Today, you will be with me in paradise. You know, being at a man or woman's deathbed is a, is a very sobering moment when life in this world is ebbing away. Very often, people are frightened. Some are angry, some are bitter. But at the bedside of a Christian, more often than not, there is peace and tranquility as the moment approaches when the King of all glory, the Lamb of God, the great I am, finally takes the Christian brother or sister home to be with Jesus in paradise. The hope of heaven is no longer classed as hope. It's a moment when it all becomes very real and staggeringly wonderful. So on this hillside this morning, we see two very different last moments, two very different reactions to the man who hangs between them. So let's look at the first reaction, which is, as we've heard, one of defiance and bitterness. Verse 39, one of the criminals who were, were hanged railed at him, saying, Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. Here you see this man filled with hatred, hurling insults and abuse, probably to the crowd as well as Jesus, as well as Jesus. You sense the bitterness, the anger in his words as he sarcastically questions that Jesus. Are you not the Christ? You see, this criminal would have had some head knowledge of Christ, the Messiah the one who the Jews had been predicting would come for hundreds and hundreds of years now. This man would have heard all about Jesus and what had been going on. Everybody would have been talking about him. Maybe he'd heard about his miracles. Maybe he had heard of the crowds who would follow Jesus for days and, and hear his teaching, teaching that was with unusual authority. This Jesus, he had heard to be the one who claimed to be the way, the truth, and the life. Maybe you'd heard about him. And like most people, had dismissed Jesus as a, as a fraud, as a false prophet. Like those who had been and gone before. But now, circumstances had brought him up close to this Jesus, the Christ. Here he was, a, a dying man who had the ear of Jesus. And yet all he could do was insult him. Can you imagine the privilege of having the Son of God next to you when you're dying? If you ever wanted someone to be at your bedside, it would be Jesus, wouldn't it? As you entered into eternity. But he didn't see that. All he could do was insult him. Not only did Jesus have to bear the excruciating physical pain, but he had to endure the taunts and the abuse of many, including this criminal. His, the Lord's, was no quiet, peaceful passing in a hospice bed. In his last moments, his ears were ringing with the abuse of those who just couldn't see those who were blind to the truth. To the truth that this act of sacrifice on the cross was for them. He was being punished for their transgressions. This was the, the supreme act of, of love. But they couldn't see it. And this criminal was one of those who didn't understand who Jesus was. 
Aren't you the Christ, he would say. Aren't you the man who is supposed to save his people? Then save me. Save yourself. Come on. Even as this criminal was dying, there is no sense of remorse. No sense of guilt for a life of crime. In his lifetime, he'd no doubt hurt lots of people. But no repentance. No seeking after forgiveness. He'd lived an angry, selfish life. And here he was, dying. An angry, selfish death. Save us. Save yourself, was his bitter, sarcastic cry. And Jesus could have saved himself. He could have called on a, a legion of angels to rescue him from his suffering. But no. He allowed it to happen. He had a job to do. He had a role to fulfill. He was about to defeat evil once and for all. He was about to crush the serpent's head. He was about to save the lost. This selfless act of mercy was for our benefit. So we wouldn't stop it. This criminal didn't see it. He didn't believe it. And all he could do was insult him. He had a chance to make peace with God. He had a chance in that moment to know forgiveness for all his wrongdoing. He was inches away from the Saviour. But soon, he would be separated from him forever. Never again to have the offer of salvation. He blew it. He remained blind to the Saviour. This morning, in your homes, at this moment, you too have a chance to trust your life to Jesus. You have an opportunity to turn to him in faith, believing that he is the light of this dark world that we're living in. Believing that he can forgive and will forgive. Don't you blow it. This may be the last time you ever hear this good news. Don't go to your death. As this criminal did. Still shaking your fist in unbelief at the son of God who came for you. No, be like the other criminal who came in his last moments in faith. Don't have defiance. Be devoted. So let's read about the other man. Verse 40. But the other rebuked him saying, Do you not fear God since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we are receiving the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. But, the Bible says at the beginning of verse 40, the, the conjunction, the joining word. It signifies a, a very different attitude. This other criminal is different. He was angry, but it was a different kind of anger. He was angry at the other criminal. He rebuked him. Shut up, will you? Don't you fear God? We deserve punishment. He doesn't. He's innocent. We're guilty. He was saying to the other criminal, you're about to die. You're on the brink of eternity. You're about to face your maker in judgment. Is there no fear within you? Your life is ebbing away. And God is waiting. Solomon, one of the 
The wisest men in the Bible said this in Proverbs 1 verse 7. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. The punishment that the Romans were dishing out to these criminals was nothing compared to the judgment that they were both about to face. The full anger of God was about to be brought to bear on them. God was about to pronounce them guilty as charged. Guilty for turning away from him. Guilty for breaking his laws. Guilty for not believing in his son whom he had sent for them. Guilty, guilty, guilty. And only hell awaited them now. This criminal whose blind spiritual eyes were gradually opening was fearful of what was to come. He sensed that he was about to see his maker, I'm sure, and he, he needed someone to save him from the condemnation that was about to be levied at him. So he turned his head towards the Christ, to Jesus. How wonderful that is when, when you just think about it for a moment. In his hour of greatest need, the Savior was right there by his side. The shepherd was there for the sheep. And the criminal was calling out to the shepherd. He realized he was guilty. He believed that this emaciated, naked, bedraggled man hanging next to him was who he claimed to be, the Son of God. And he uttered these words of faith. Verse 42, and he said, Jesus... Remember me when you come into your kingdom. Wonderful words of faith. You can sense the man's humility in these words. You can sense that he knew just who he was next to. This was the Christ. The King of the Jews, the King of the nations. The Lord of the universe, the creator and sustainer of all things. The sovereign King who reigns. And he was next to him. In these words you sense the man's smallness. His humility. You sense his repentant heart. I deserve to die, Jesus. You don't. You are guiltless. You are the lamb, pure and undefiled. But I... I'm worthless. Forgive me, Jesus. Remember me when you come into your kingdom. What a contrast with the other guy. This man was broken and he reacted with a believing heart. The other man on the, on the other side, he too was broken, but he reacted in bitterness. So what would your response have been had you hung next to Jesus? This man was now a man of faith. He knew at that moment the truth of, of Romans 10, 9, that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And that's what happened to him. He was saved. This dying man was saved. He wasn't saved from the death that we all have to go through. But from the anger of God and his righteous judgment. He was saved from the second death. He was saved from hell. And headed for heaven. Listen to the words of Jesus. Verse 43. And he said to him, Truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. What a majestic answer the Saviour gave him. You'll be with me in paradise. Today. This day you will rejoice in a place far better than this. 
A place where there's no loneliness, no anger, no fear, no arguments. A place where you are pure and holy in, in my sight. A place where you'll no longer have to battle with your sin. A place where you no, will no longer feel, feel guilty for being the wretched man that you are. No, today you will know perfect joy, perfect love, perfect peace forever in the paradise of heaven. The Apostle Paul was right when he said, didn't he, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Gain because we go to such a place as this, the paradise of heaven. What a hope we have. There is a happy ending. And it's in fact just the beginning. And please note here that Jesus didn't say, well, you can come to paradise after you've helped others and been a good person. He didn't say that. Well, you can come to paradise after you've been confirmed or baptised. didn't say that either. He didn't say you can come after you've lived this good and wholesome life. No, you see, this thief couldn't do any of those things. His situation didn't allow it. He was nailed to a cross. In a few hours, they were going to break his legs to hasten his death. He had no opportunity, did he, to get down off that cross and do those good works. All he had was faith. And by faith he was saved. Not of good works, lest any man should boast. We see on this thief's cross the truth that you cannot earn your way to heaven. All Christ wants is that you love him with all your heart, with all your mind with all your strength that you believe him and trust him and in the few moments that the thief had left on earth that is what he did can I ask you this morning as I come to a close in the moments that you have left on earth and none of us knows how long that is is that what you're going to do? To love God with all your heart, with all your strength, with all your mind, with all your soul. To trust him and believe in him, to live a life of faith. Because if you do, if you're a believer, then your reward will be the same as this dying criminal. Today, you will be with me in paradise so my time's gone we've witnessed this morning these two criminals dying either side of the son of God one of them believed and the other didn't which are you this morning amen let's pray father we thank you that you sent your son who is the way, the, the truth, and the life. Help us to see that, all of us to see that again afresh this morning as we worship you. Help us as we listen to some songs now to rejoice in their truth. Help us to know that we join with the myriads and myriads of the angelic host who are proclaiming, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Help us to know this morning that we are journeying on and that one day we will be with you Lord forever in paradise thank you thank you for doing such a wonderful thing for sinners such as we your mercy your grace is overwhelming thank you Lord Amen. Well, please join with us at the usual time tonight at 6.30. Um, and then again on, on Wednesday with our Zoom prayer meeting. It'd be great to see you. 
And remember those emails that I asked you about earlier on. Can you send your email or, or ring the number and let us know whether you're interested in joining with us in a socially distanced congregation um, in, this, in the coming few weeks. And we'll let you know the exact date. But Lord bless you. Have a, have a, have a great day. Thank you. Because we have just received their boxes. Kids are so excited. Giving them a gift, do it in Jesus' name. And that's what this is all about. Operation Christmas Child is about expressing the love of God. It's its wonderful way to enter into the Christmas spirit in its true meaning. Some of them go by train, some go by camels, some go by ships. These boxes go all over the world. And that is only the beginning. So when the children have got their boxes, they are invited to take part in something called The Greatest Journey. Which is a 12 lesson discipleship program where they learn about the greatest gift, which is Jesus Christ. Ni papa, ni lola, ni lolo, ni papa, mama, get mama, ti da ken ni apunchos. This year has been a pandemic year. Children are hurting all over the world. People are afraid. Families are scared. People have lost their jobs. They don't know where to go, what to do. They don't know what hope they have for the future. And when you pack a shoebox and send it to Operation Christmas Child, it gives us an opportunity to give that box to a child and do it in Jesus' name. It's an incredible gift. And so I just want to say thank you. We need your help this year more than we've ever needed it because of the pandemic. When the light of the gospel is turned on, it makes everything new. Operation Christmas Child opens doors for people to discover what is the greatest gift of all, the love of God through Jesus. It's now easier than ever to pack a shoebox in four simple steps. Step one, go to shoeboxonline.org.uk. Step two, choose who you want to pack a shoebox for. Step three, add toys to your shoebox. Step four, Personalise your box, add a photo of yourself, and pay for your gift. And all the toys and gifts are packed and sent for you. Thank you for partnering with us. We hope that through our work, children will come to know how much God loves them. Get started at shoeboxonline.org.uk